Hi, everyone. This is my first time in Montreal. This is a wonderful place. I wish I could be here for much longer. Um, so if you're just coming in, feel free to sit like, or move up a little bit. It makes it easier for me to project at you, but you don't have to. Um, I'd like to talk about sound. And the first thing I'd like you to do in your life, like maybe later today or tomorrow, is just listen. If you're on an airplane and there's a baby crying behind you, or listen for the low frequency rumbling of the plane, or if you're using a home appliance, listen to how that sounds. Just be a little bit more aware. How many things are going on right now? There's people speaking over there. There's all sorts of um, nature noise if you listen to that. But it becomes difficult to really critically listen because we're so used to dealing with the sound in everyday life. So not only do we have all the sounds from nature, we have all of the future sounds that are showing up in our lives all the time. It's been predicted that we'll have 50 billion connected devices. Whatever this number is, um, now we have devices that finally outnumber the number of people on the wor in the world. And all of them, most all of them make sound. So that's, that's a lot of noise, whether it's a smart watch that sends you new alerts, or whether that's a smart fridge that's beeping at you in the middle of the night, or a home appliance that beeps at you when it's done or screeches at you. Uh, when you put them all together, you get what I like to call the dystopian kitchen of the future, or the dystopian home of the future, in which everything is beeping at you, doing a software update, getting attacked by hackers, increasing the service area of attack, using more bandwidth than it takes to stream a Game of Thrones on Netflix, and you don't have anything left for you as a human. And I don't know about you, I think home technology is fun, but I don't want to be a system administrator to live in my own home. That's not as fun. I just want to go home and have more human time. So we live in this kind of interruptive world. And this interruptive world means that we have batteries that go away at some point. We have the interruptions that we pay attention to. We forget to turn off all of these alerts. And we're just constantly inundated. The Greeks had two words for time. Chronos time, which is the kind of industrial time. You have 9 AM appointment, 10 AM appointment. You're supposed to do these specific things in these times. But they also had a word, kairos time, for human time. Human time is the time that you talk about on your deathbed. It's the time of falling in love. It's the time of looking at a sunset. It's the time of having a kid. It's these weird human moments that we can't really quantify. That's the time we come up with our innovative ideas, where we think outside of this very Kronos time. It's the time when you look at a mountain and you realize, what are you doing with your life? You have to quit your job and do a startup. Or while you're at the startup, our product is useless. Let's shut it down and do something else with our lives. That's the memorable human time. And when it keeps getting interrupted by this Kronos time of these alerts, especially auditory alerts, we get in trouble and we get distracted from our everyday reality. There's also health effects from long-term sound on us. For instance, alert fatigue is one of the leading cause of mistakes at hospitals. My dad uh, had cancer, and I watched him suffer through that. Uh, he was an audio engineer. And if you can imagine him sitting with all of these displays, beeping at him all night, made it really hard for him to go to sleep. It was incredibly distracting. Um, all the patients were confused, and the doctors and the nurses heard 1 to 10,000 alerts every day. And that meant that they were so overwhelmed that they stopped responding to them. So new nurses will take an average of seven minutes to respond to an alert. Veteran nurses will take up to 40 minutes to respond to that same alert because they're exhausted of hearing all of this sound. Sound is one of the fastest senses. It's hard to turn off. And when these appliances are approved by underwriters, laboratories, and electrical engineer associations, they have to operate in a specific frequency. And it's the really obnoxious frequency that we hate, kind of similar frequency to babies crying. And so we want to ignore that. And when we hear it too much and something never changes, none of these sounds really change and have something interesting to them, our brain just ignores them, just like looking at an ad on a website. You, you start to ignore it over time. Airplane cabins. They can be pretty loud. They can be anywhere from 85 to 95 decibels. At four hours, you start to experience what could lead to hearing loss. So if you're on a plane for more than four hours, you should probably wear some foam earplugs, noise-canceling headphones, anything like that. Uh, it's the same for listening to music at high volume for a long time. 
And it is not that we can't fix this with, with hearing aids or surgery, but it's just something that you can avoid. Once I started wearing noise-canceling headphones in airplanes, I noticed that after a 10-hour flight, I was totally fine. Like, other than, you know, hydrating, part of my brain was constantly operating, waiting for, you know, trying to decipher all of the sound that was going on in the background. And once I reduced that, my fatigue reduced overall. And I started getting sick less as well. So I didn't even notice that the thing that I got used to was always there and was actually detrimentally affecting my health. Um, this is just a little audio program called Decibel Levels. It's not entirely accurate, but gives you a good understanding. You can get it on iPhone. Just a little decibel meter will tell you that, like, I put it on a plane and it was 94 decibels. Imagine that for eight hours. And then I put the noise-canceling headphones on and recorded, and it went down to 74. And I was just very happy. Now I sit on flights and there's a baby screaming behind me, and I'm, I don't need, I could care less. You know, I just fall asleep. Um, so the other problem is that we have unintentional sound in our spaces. After a while, especially after New York and the whole industrial romantic ideas of these factories and warehouses, um, we started to approve spaces visually instead of listening to them. So if you look at these old spaces where symphonies are, they're, they're beautiful and ornate and they have soft materials. Like if you go to your grandparents' house, there's all these rugs, hopefully, and couches, and it's this sense of coziness. But when you go to an open office, the walls aren't treated. Basically, walls that are flat and reflective reflect sound as if it's a mirror. It just goes, bounces right back off. So if you're trying to do a conference, I mean, in this space, too, like it's hard to understand me because there's all sorts of reverb in this space. So if you're in a conference room and you're in this very echoey conference room and you're trying to talk to somebody and they're in an echoey conference room, your brain has to take twice or four times the amount of work to actually understand that signal and you're more likely to get annoyed and anxious, you're less likely to have a productive conference call, and it's actually costing people time. How can you actually get work done in a space where you can hear everybody all the way from one side of the space to the other? Other than putting on noise-canceling headphones, you can actually just hang absorbing materials from the ceiling. You can just get big sheets of cloth and just hang them in decoration. You can put actual couches in, not these industrial couches that are awful. But you can, you can start to fix these spaces. And once you do that, people are going to go home sick slightly less. They're going to have more productive meeting time. They might actually like sitting there. And well, you can't solve the other problems, like people getting sick in an open office. But you can start to improve a space. And some of the spaces that we go to to relax are the same way. Here's a really reflective industrial restaurant. There are no soft surfaces in this place at all. And there's an open bar. Sometimes they have an open kitchen. You can hear everything going on in the kitchen. And that means that people in these environments at 95 decibels for eight hour shifts are going to have hearing loss later. They're going to have more sick days. Um, the tables actually turn a little bit quicker. So you have technically more profitability. But if people are going homesick more, you lose that extra profitability. And this stuff doesn't need to be ugly looking. It can be beautiful. It can be like a nice canvas painting that's also made of absorbing material. You can put, see if in, in here, you can put those wood beams. You can put them everywhere. And that actually will like diffuse the sound. Um, but we're in this period where we took all of the decoration away and all of the complexity away. And now we have to relearn <laughs> the reason that we put those in there in the first place, you know, in the 1200s and the 1600s and all the different things that we came up with because we're so obsessed with what it looks like visually. Um, so open office, coffee shops, restaurants, bars, concrete, floor to ceiling windows, all of the low frequencies of traffic are coming through. Um, everything that happens in a space like somebody dropping their phone is heard everywhere else. Um, but we can start to fix these, like double pane windows will start to trap some of the sound in between. And if we start to do this, we can just have a better experience as humans um, because we deserve it. I mean, we're just getting distracted a lot. So how do we improve sound design in products? I went through and I just tried to ask a bunch of different people. I even asked people like who designed the Intel sound logo and just had all these conversations trying to figure out what makes sound annoying? How do we make it easier to use? 
How do we allow people to turn it off? And how do we improve just this overlooked quality? We have all of these words for visual. We have less words for sound. And the words that we have for sound are usually used by audio engineers. My dad was an audio engineer. A lot of my friends are audio engineers. None of you want to hear about Fourier transforms. You just want to make something that's not bad, hopefully. Um, so one of the first things to do is just use better quality hardware. If you're making a product that makes a sound and you use really bad hardware, you can design a beautiful sound, um, like a piano. And the problem is when you play just one note on a piano, there's a hammer that hits a string. And that onset transient is so big that it can overwhelm the hardware. And so it just sounds distorted. So if you want a piano to show up and have this nice, beautiful, clear sound, you have to have better hardware. Um, in the hearing spectrum, the reason why a lot of these sounds are annoying is that if you actually look through um, the hertz that people can hear, over in this right section, the, in the high mids, they don't, those sounds don't actually have to be that loud, and our, hear, our ears can hear them. And so when you're actually mixing something like a song, you want to leave all this space so that you can bump up all the, the low end because that's really hard for us to hear. You have to make that really loud for people to hear. But all of these really annoying, squeaky, high-pitched sounds, you don't even have to play them that loud for people to hear them. And so that, that ends up being what we use. But if we use higher quality hardware, we can get at more of these sounds, and we can start to make information-based sounds that are way more interesting. Um, so alarm clock sounds. A, a lot of these annoying, like, er, 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 are these square waves. They're just computer-generated waves. If you just change the wave type to a sawtooth wave, you get a little bit of even and odd harmonics. And there's something interesting in that that people can hook onto. And if you take this a step further, you wouldn't make an alarm clock that just goes er, 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 or plays a song. You can actually use the information on somebody's calendar and kind of sonify it. So Mark Weiser, who's one of the creators of Calm Technology, said, well, what if I just took some information in my calendar and I just made it so that if, if it was a busy day, it could be like a quick, urgent tune so people would get you know, woken up faster. Or you could have like a calm, I don't know, Sunday morning, and it would be you know, slower and lackadaisical. So you, don't, you knew you had a little bit more time to wake up. But embedding information in the sounds is really important when the visual interface is really stressful. This is just a week, I think a week worth of material from uh, the Large Hadron Collider uh, in, um, in Switzerland. It's, in particle physics, you have so many particle events going into a detector that you can't pay attention to all of them. And you, you can color code them all you want. Same with stock trading. You're just going to get overwhelmed. So what particle physicists have started to do is just embed some of this information into different tones. And then they can hang out do other work, and listen. And that's taking one sense of visual that's, that's overstimulated and turning it to another sense of sound. And then they can be accustomed to doing a couple more things than just once. So now they can listen, and they know if something really important is happening. Um, you can also just remove sound from a product. The problem is that not all products make sound intentionally. Like, you can design an alert into a product and take it out. But a lot of what makes sound in products is a lot more complicated to remove. So sound can become a differentiator. So Dyson said, look, the hairdryer hasn't really been innovated, or the vacuum cleaner hasn't really been innovated since the 1960s, 1970s. Let's do something about that. So they spent two to four years figuring out how to make a quiet hairdryer. It's been proven now that hair dryers are actually destroying your hearing because they're so loud. They're right next to your ears. They're waking up your spouse. They're just super disruptive. And so what they said is, we'll figure out what makes a product loud, what makes a motor loud, and we will engineer a quieter product. They spent so much money doing this, but the result was this really quiet um, hair dryer. And that totally changed the plan. Like, if you're an entrepreneur and you want to make a new product, spending a lot of time on making something quieter, like a leaf blower, for instance, means everybody will just buy your product, even if it's a little bit more expensive. And regulations might show up where you can't play something that loud in a neighborhood. So there's a lot of opportunities. So what causes noise in products? A lot of products like air conditioners, for instance, they were made in factories. They're made to cool down factories. 
And all that happened is they got miniaturized, and now we have an air conditioner in our house, and the house is, you know, 300 square meters, and we're still dealing with this horrible sound. Uh, it's the same with a fridge, same with all these different products. So we can't just shrink them. We have to consider where the sound came from and that we're living in smaller spaces and things can't be as loud anymore. So one of the things when a motor, uh, when a motor whirs around or if something's vibrating or a car that's on a road, if there's any empty space anywhere in that product, it's going to make a sound. So I was, for this project, taking apart cars to see what they were doing because a car is on a road at like 100 kilometers an hour and it's constantly in use. Uh, all, everything is vibrating. So you take apart a car door and all of that empty space, if there's no padding in it, it will actually wobble and vibrate and make all these annoying sounds. And the same with the car door. There's actually this kind of vibroacoustic rubber material and that keeps the wind from coming in and making all these weird currents, slowing the car down a little bit, but making this awful whistling sound. So a cheap car doesn't have as many sound insulating materials. An expensive car does. And that's one of the biggest cost differentiators in cars. Um, so you can just fill empty spaces with materials, and that will help if a product is motorized. Uh, another thing is just component fit. So if you have a motor and the components don't fit that well together, like in a really cheap fan, it's going to rattle and vibrate, and that's what causes a lot of that fan sound. It's awful. So what Dyson did with their hair dryer is they actually rented um, tools from like nuclear missile creation from the UK military. <laughs> and they said, we're going to engineer the pieces in this hair dryer engine so close together that when they operate at incredibly high speeds, they're not going to rattle and make a loud sound. And they spent all this extra time doing that to make something very quiet. So it's the same with a really nice car. The components fit closer together, so you'd use a different kind of machine oil, and then eventually they'll get a little bit looser, and you can use a thicker viscosity oil. So there's different ways you can think about it. It's a little bit more expensive, but you end up with a better product. Containerization is another one. So if you've ever been to one of those juice stores, uh, they, put your, they put your materials in a juice bar, and then they press this horrible blend button, and then the people taking your order can't hear anything. So not only uh, are you in one of these spaces that's all concrete and glass and steel that's reflecting all the sound, but you have these like 95 decibel blenders going on all the time, and everybody hates each other, everyone hates working there, there's more sick days, and nobody wants to get your product. So you can kind of treat the material behind the blender on the wall with an absorbing material to absorb the sound waves that are reflecting back. That's one way of doing it. But another way that was found out by this blend tech corporation, they said one of the issues is that you can make component fit great, but this, uh, the base that it's on, if it's on a counter, it's going to vibrate against the counter. So they put this rubberized base, and they get some of the low frequencies to be absorbed through the rubber, so it's not going to vibrate on the table. But then they found out that if you containerize everything, everything can, can have this little container for the motor, then a container around that, and then they just put the whole blender into a container, and so the sound waves get isolated between um, the first container and the second container, and then the third container and the fourth container. It just keeps going. And at the end of the day, you have a blender that's quieter than human conversation. This costs like $1,000, <laughs> but Everybody has to use it in these professional settings. It's required to have a better user experience. So if you make something like this, it doesn't matter if it costs a lot of money. People will have to buy it. There's nothing else better on the market. Well, there's two that, that compete against each other. But it's just incredible to see what happened. I mean, it's a blender. Who thinks about these things? But in every single situation, there's an opportunity. And then, of course, vibration. This is some of the vibro, vibro acoustic material that's in the back of a car. Um, because there was a little bit of empty space and there's materials that don't exactly fit. And so when you don't have good fit, you can just put this weird rubberized asphalt in there and then things are better. Um, so how many things as you go through your life, like or use the restrooms over there or anything, can you think about that are really loud and obnoxious? And what could you do to actually make them better? Because there's so many opportunities. That was, a, that was a microphone that fell on the floor, by the way. Thanks, that was good timing. Thank you. Um, 
one of the most difficult experiences I've had is when I used to have a startup company and I had an employee that got an insulin pump installed. And he was so excited because he was a normal human. He didn't have to just inject himself with insulin, it would just automatically regulate his insulin, but he had to refill it sometimes. And when he had to refill it, it would make this piercing beep. And when I was in a meeting with him, I heard the piercing beep and I said, what's going on? Did you leave your phone on? Or is that your insulin pump? And he said, it's insulin pump. He said, I went to like a wedding and a funeral and a movie and people are hearing this. It shows up at night and it wakes me up. And I said, well, do they allow you to change it into a buzz or turn it off? And he said, no, the actual manufacturer does not allow you to change the notification style. Like when in doubt, when you're designing something, allow people to turn it off or if it's a life or death situation, allow them to change it to a haptic buzz so somebody can feel it. When he's at a loud dinner party or a concert, he will miss the notification and he won't be able to understand it. It's really gruesome actually. And I actually talked in Sweden and one of the kids in the audience had an insulin pump and he said, yeah, it keeps me up at night. We've put all these support tickets in. There's an entire forum on trying to turn this thing off. They basically have to hack it, breaking the warranty and then putting their own lives in danger to turn this thing off. Um, so when in doubt, you can change something to another sense. Sometimes the information is for you alone. Like if you hear a Microsoft Outlook notification, you shouldn't be hearing that. That should be a buzz or something. This is a silly thing, but it's the Lumo Smart Posture Sensor. So this just buzzes you when you have poor posture. But it's just a buzz. You don't have a thing that sounds at you. And so changing the notification style into a different sense is one way of informing people without overburdening their consciousness with all this information. And having audio pollution that affects other people. Um, context is really important. Microsoft made this inclusivity toolkit, but it's about um, that just in the United States alone, there are 21 million people, where there are maybe 20, 2 million people with permanent disabilities, but there are 21 million people with um, situational or temporary disabilities. And that means somebody who can't hear because it's too loud in a bar, or somebody who's carrying a baby so they only have one hand, or there's all these different situations. And so this toolkit actually allows you to go through and test your product for all the different contexts that it could be used in, because there's so many products that are used in mobile contexts or in cars. And so for instance, the Jawbone um, Bluetooth speaker had this notification that would happen in the middle of the night that said, battery low, please charge. What was happening is when you have the thing charging and then you decide to bring it into another room for like a house party, you're going to leave it there even after you're done with the house party, turn it off, go to sleep, and in the middle of the night it will wake up and say, jawbone, battery low, please charge, really, really loud at the volume you had for your party. And once they learned that, they, had to, they said, well, we'll never do that. <laughs> we'll just have a light that turns on that says red or anything like that. But once you think through these things, it's, it's really hard to do because a lot of user testing is done in a lab under perfect conditions. You have to remember what's the suboptimal condition this product can be used in and how can I make that also okay? Um, block senses, if somebody can't see or speak or hear or touch, allow people to change the notification style so it's not just sound or it's not just speech. Um, technology can communicate but it doesn't need to speak. How many of you like a disembodied computer voice on anything that you do? The problem with a disembodied computer voice saying, hi, I'm Siri, how can I help you? Is that you have to translate it into a bunch of different languages. It doesn't necessarily understand you the first time unless you have a perfect San Franciscan accent. And it has a big issue with, um, uh, just with, I think the biggest issue is once something speaks to you in a language that seems human, your expectation is that you can speak back to it in a human language and that it will understand you perfectly. Now, of course, this is never the case. These things are full of dead ends. So if you look at Star Wars, you have C-3PO who understands 200,000 languages, but he's an annoying, an annoying bot in every single one of those languages. Or you have R2-D2, which just has a tonal-based language that's very simple. R2-D2, you can tell whether he's happy or sad. It's simple. So, when people are communicating with R2-D2, it's like, you know that you can kind of understand, but you're not having a full conversation like with C-3PO, and the results are going to be better. So with a Roomba, the Roomba basically has this tonal language. It goes dun-dun-dun-dun when it's done, and dun-dun when it's stuck. 
You know exactly what it is. It doesn't have to be translated. It has a backup light that tells you it's either orange or green, and you help it. It's not trying to do everything for you. Uh, just like those little pocket pet Tamagotchis, the thing that bonded us to the technology was that it was helpless and we had to help it out. We had to feed it. This Roomba doesn't even clean corners. It's a subpar vacuum. This is not a great piece of technology. But we love it, we treat it like a pet, cats ride around on it instead of running away from it, and we see them in YouTube videos, and it's all because this is an appropriate level of technology for what we have in the state of art today. It's not trying to be more than it is, it's not trying to be your smart assistant, it's not shaped like a human, it's shaped like a prehistoric filter feeder trilobite that's cleaning the ocean floor. That's great, that's already been evolved for how many hundred million years it works, it's settled, we can just make our technology and its image and we'll be fine. So if we look at any other situations like this, we'll probably find a lot of opportunities. This is a kind of ambient awareness. So at Xerox Park, which is a research group that created Ethernet and the graphic user interface and a lot of these really early technologies about being human with a technology, uh, they had artists and anthropologists to counter the technologists. Um, there's a good story about this woman, Lucy Suchman, who came in and realized that people hated printers, and they hated them because they had so many buttons, and they were just trying to get their job done. And the engineers loved it because you could touch any of the buttons and had full control from the outside interface. And she said, well, most people just want to press the copy button, so can we make a big green button that just says copy? And this is the thing, if an anthropologist or an artist or somebody that's not fully tech comes in and kind of rebalances the situation, you can get to insights that you don't necessarily, you could never get to. We could always have printers that had to have a skilled technician operate them, and they'd be stuck in an office in this horrible kind of dungeon-like situation, and we have dedicated people to use them. And that's, we kind of still have that, but they're mostly user-friendly at this point. We can print and copy fairly easily. This is by an artist, Natalie Germanjenko, with Mark Weiser. And what Natalie Germanjenko said is, well, in a water cooler, people will gather around and see information, but she attached uh, just a motor to a piece of string and attached that to the network. And so whenever anybody was doing int anything interesting on the internal network at Xerox Park, it would whir around and make noise, and people would run to it and try to figure out what somebody was doing. And then they would look, people had these little park badges so you could kind of see who was where in the company. And then they would just go and check out what people were working on. It's way better than having a birthday party. But this kind of ambient awareness gets you to understand where something is or what's happening without having to be fully attuned to it. If you take it one step further, you can embed information that was formerly one sense into another. So this is a, a hue light bulb from Philips, and it's just attached to a weather report. So it shows the color of the weather. And I was living in Portland, Oregon at the time, and every morning I woke up and this light was blue because it was going to rain during the day. But this particular morning I woke up and the light was yellow because it was sunny out and it was going to be sunny and I got really excited. This was kind of made as a counter to the idea of a lot of these futuristic videos where you have like a single guy who lives in San Francisco who speaks with a perfect accent, who has the very quiet condo, who wakes up, and some weird disembodied female voice says, hi Dave, how's your morning going? Here's your agenda for the day. And then he has to wait like three minutes for the whole agenda to be spilled out in this incredibly slow, obnoxious voice versus just walking into your kitchen and getting an ambient awareness of what's going on. So how do you take all of that and reduce it into a tiny sense, the least amount of tech to get the job done and not the most amount? Um, sometimes you have to add sound. So when electric vehicles started, actually most of every, auto, uh, every automotive sound is mostly designed because now they're really efficient. They don't make like cool Ferrari sounds. Like there are sound designers making Ferrari sounds to make it sound really powerful. The engines are way too efficient for that. But when electric vehicles started to come out, when they backed up, they didn't make any sound. So sound engineers had to actually make these backup sounds so that you, you would remember that they existed. So sometimes when things are too efficient, you have to add something back in. Um, the right amount of tech is the minimum to solve the problem. That's really hard to do because most people are adding too much tech 
every single feature you add, every single sound you add has to be debugged, can be an attack vector, can be a support issue. Another person has to support it. Another person has to support that code library. And if you just reduce until there's nothing left to take away, then you have something really solid that you have a good expectation of how it's going to work. It's harder to convince people to do this, to have the least amount of features. But once you do, it means you really understand the product that you want to make. You totally get what people need from it, and you don't bloat it all out. If you make a platform like WordPress, you can make a core system, and everybody can build plugins to extend it, and you don't have to support those, and that's fine. You can invite the best plugins to be part of your network, but you're not building them. And that means your company isn't the five people that build the original site. It's the hundreds of thousands of people who extend your platform out into new, different shapes. These are some of my favorite technologies. If you were to build street lights today, they would be like Bluetooth, and you'd have to like Bluetooth into them, or they would be like this countdown meter, and they would be with this blue light that's awful for your eyes. But instead, they're just punctuation for your trip. You barely even notice them. It's just a simple indicator. This toilet light on the plane is one of the only shapes that doesn't change. Um, it's just an icon. You don't have to know any specific language for it. It's, you don't have to be, you know, you can be red, green, colorblind and still understand what it is. Like, can we go more to universals if we're trying to make international-based technologies? What can we make that doesn't have issues crossing borders and can last for 40 years? Like, what can you make that could last for 40 years? What if you could hand something down as an heirloom from one generation to the other? We don't even have phones that last more than a couple years before we have to get rid of them. I, I want to see operating systems that have less uh, data in them instead of more when you actually download them, that make things slightly better instead of worse. Um, this is a hard thing to ask right now because we have so many resources to build technology, but at some point when resources get really expensive, these are going to be the clear ways forward. And these things make it cheaper to run everything, so it, it becomes... I mean, I guess you can just make a longer-term company this way. It's not as exciting for the first, like, five years, but then, you know, it can be like a Philips Corporation and last through, like, world wars. Um, Mark Weiser is one of the founders of Calm Technology, and he said, at some point in the future, which is today, um, devices will outnumber humans. Technology will become really cheap. And at that point, the scarcest resource will not be the technology. It will be our attention and how technology makes or breaks our attention and works with us or against us will be our entire existence. So if we start making things that work with us and allow us to be more human, like the original promise of technology, then we have a future. Otherwise, we're going to be stuck in Kronos time all the time and not come up with anything interesting. We have way larger problems on the horizon that we're going to need lots of clever human time to solve. Um, and again, the promise of tech was that we'd have more free time, not less. And I don't know about you, but I think I have less free time because of tech. It expands to fit every single available space. Um, I wrote a book about that because the co-founder of Calm Tech died before he even got to see the future that he predicted. So I got upset. I grabbed all of his original research and I wrote it into a book. And then um, I'm releasing this Designing with Sound book. This is the first talk I've given on this particular book. So thank you for allowing me to beta test it on you. Um, I worked with a sound designer that did like a lot of Nokia ringtones. He's been working on this for like 18 years. Um, just to try and figure out what's annoying or not and how can you make better sounds. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, hope you have a great rest of your conference. <laughs>